Good morning to you. Welcome to everyone. We want today to shout and thank God. We want to have a worship that is a praise worship and thanks to him. And so we're changing the order of things you can already tell. And we ask you to follow along and participate. We're going to intermingle the singing part of worship with the lesson. And I will, each time we have sung a song, or each time I speak, I'll give you the next song that we're going to sing. It should be on the overhead, but for the benefit of those who are going to be uh, in the next room or who uh, wish to use books here, that will be an advantage to you. The first song we'll be singing is number 435. 435 will be first to be sung. You can prepare for that, and it'll be on the overhead as well. In this week in our country, we have a designated day that is called Thanksgiving. It arcs back all the way to the time when the pilgrims came to this country, and that, of course, is a historical event that we studied about in school. We didn't participate, but we understand that at the end of a very difficult year, the pilgrims gathered, perhaps also with Native Americans who joined them by that time, and they had the first Thanksgiving. That was 399 years ago last month. Almost 400 years this nation has been giving thanks. It was uh, in 1863 that President Lincoln designated the fourth Thursday of November to be the day that the nation would stop and say, thank you, Lord. But that was not the beginning of Thanksgiving. The whole concept of giving praise and thanks to God is a very biblical one that goes all the way back to the first sacrifices that ever were made. And the first time that man stopped to look up and to say, thank you, Lord. The Psalms that we find often teach us about Thanksgiving. We're going to look at one of those Psalms this morning. It's easy to remember. It's the 100th Psalm. And it is from that Psalm first that I get that idea of a saying, shout, because we want to be heard. When we're excited about something, whatever it is, if it's a football game or wherever we are, we often raise our voices. And when we're telling people about things that have excited us, we're raising our voices. And when the psalm begins, the hundredth psalm, the psalmist says, make a joyful noise to the Lord. That's the idea. I did, that's the idea of shouting. Get involved emotionally. Make that joyful noise. Quite often, those who feel like they can't sing well take some solace in the fact that he didn't say, make a beautiful noise. He said, make a joyful noise. And that all of us can be excited and we all can shout to the Lord and give our thanks to him. Make a joyful no noise to the Lord and all the earth demanding that everything involved and everyone involved should be realizing that God has good and God has blessed us in so many ways. We're excited, excited that we're the ones who benefit from all the blessings that God gives, that he's our father, that he sheds and showers upon us all the time great blessings, that of greatest of all the blessings that we have experienced and can experience is salvation that we can be the sons and daughters of God, that we can be the body of Christ upon this earth. Indeed, it's something to celebrate. In the Psalms 107 and verse 2, there is the encouragement for us. Let those who belong to the Lord say so. Those who are redeemed of the Lord, let them say so. Let them speak of it. Let them be excited enough to thank God for all the good blessings that he has given. And whenever we have the opportunity, as we do today, to come together in his name, in his presence, and Jesus said, I'll be there with you when you're gathered together. It is such a blessing to come into his presence. But the song we sing speaks of coming into his presence 
with thanksgiving. And now Jed will lead us in coming to his presence. 435. Come into his presence with thanksgiving in our hearts and give him praise and give him praise. Come into his presence with thanksgiving in our hearts, our voices raise, your voices raise. Give glory and honor and power unto him, Jesus, the name above all names. Come into presence with thanksgiving in your heart and give him praise and give him praise come into his presence with thanksgiving in your heart your voices raise your voices raise give glory Our next song will be 147, 100, I'm sorry, that's the psalm I'm looking at here, 455, and 113, 113 will be the next song. If we look at these verses that are involved in the 100th psalm, we notice that first one we've already covered. He says that we all ought to make a joyful noise to the Lord and that the whole earth should do so. And... It goes on then in verse 2 to point out that we should serve the Lord with gladness and come into his presence with singing. Singing, that's one of the things that allows us to express joy and thankfulness and all of that and just come into his presence with the, 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 the spirit of gratitude. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. All the time saying thank you in the the writings of the David in Psalms 147 and in verse 7 that time, he said, sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. There's so much that God has given to us. And so many of the songs, if we really stop to analyze the message that's involved, so many of the songs are, in fact, lifting up our voices to God to say thank you. Thank you, thank you. For the things that are so often, in fact, taken for granted, much more than they ought ever to be, but because they always are there, we have the tendency to assume, perhaps even to presume, that God will provide without saying thank you for what he gives. And so these Psalms urge us to be, be recalling constantly, over and over again, to offer thanks to him. In fact, in the New Testament, the urging of the Apostle Paul is to pray always, giving thanks to God. Pray without ceasing, he said. But in that, he always urged in Colossians 3 and in 1 Thessalonians, he said, above all, you all need to be giving thanks to God. And we are guilty sometimes of assuming that those things will come to us. Because the, the psalmist gets to, to verse 3, and he says something that's very obvious to us whenever we really analyze the situation, but he says, know that the Lord, he is God. Make note of this, he said. Make note of the fact that it's God who gives everything. James said that every good and perfect gift is from above. It comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation that is cast by the shadow of turning. He's consistent. He's always giving. And there's not a thing that's good that comes to us that doesn't come from God. We, in our human perspective, so often may think, well, look what I've done. 
look, I, what I have accomplished, and I've pulled myself up by my own bootstraps, and I've become whatever I am on my own. But no, God gives us, by his providence, the opportunities. In fact, whenever Moses wrote to the people, spoke directly originally to the people of Israel, the children of God, Whenever they were about to enter into the promised land in Deuteronomy chapter 8, he urged them, beginning of verse 11, when you get into your new place, when you get into the promised land, he said, take care, lest you forget that it is God who gives you the power to get wealth. It is he who lays out the opportunities, not just to be there to be prosperity available, but to make us well, keep us strong, have us have talent and ability to do the things that we do so that those remunerations that we receive in terms of physical support upon this earth really belong to and come from him originally. That's the source of it all. And so he calls us to know this, note this, that the Lord, he is God. We are not, nor is our government or any other earthly entity. The Lord, he is God. No wonder the scriptures speak of him as the Lord God Almighty. He is the source of all good and wonderful things. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. If we are the sheep of his pasture, he's the shepherd. He's the one who protects us. He's the one who cares for us. He's the one who supplies us with all the things that we need, all the things that we have. By his grace, we are whatever we are. I love the passage that the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians in chapter 15 and verse 10, a part of that verse says, For by the grace of God, I am what I am. If we took away the grace and providence of God from every one of our lives, we wouldn't be who we are, and in all likelihood, we wouldn't even be here today. We might not know each other. We might not know our spouses. Our children might never have been because the providence of God didn't bring us together with our spouse and produce these ones. Every good and every perfect gift is from above. And he is God in charge of it all. He's the one who blesses us so profoundly and we couldn't do anything without him. By the grace of God, I am, we could say, who we are, we are where we are, and we are what we are. And if there's anything that ought to be put at the top of the pedestal would be that we are his children and we are the sheep of his pasture. He is our shepherd and our father and our leader and he makes all good things come. And we are profoundly moved when we really stop to realize that his grace reaches me. Number 113. Deeper than the ocean and wider of the Savior for sinners like me, sin from the Father.
The grace of God is profound, and it is in our life. That passage, when it says that we are the sheep of his pasture, reminds us of the 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The whole of that real Psalm is umbrellaed by that one critical upfront statement, with God as our shepherd, we're not going to need anything we don't have. From the green pastures to the still waters, to the walking through even the valley of the shadow of death, we can indeed know and feel that we are protected and trust that he will be there. Jesus, in John chapter 10, spoke of the fact that he is the good shepherd. And he reminds us that the good shepherd is not somebody who's for hire, but he owns the sheep. He's invested in them entirely. If there's ever been an investment in anybody that is entire, it is the investment that Jesus made in our souls because he gave himself for us. He died on the cross so that we would have hope, even a chance at eternal life. That's how much. And he wants us to love each other that way. He said, I give you a new commandment. And then he explained that the new commandment is that you should love one another. The one who connects dots realized that Loving each other had been a commandment for a long, long time before Jesus said, I give you a new commandment. And the newness in his commandment he explained to be this, that you love one another even as I have loved you. You love each other like I love you, like I have demonstrated in being willing to die. He said, nobody's taking my life. No one can but I give it willingly. As he described the good shepherd there in John 10, he said the good shepherd would give his life for the sheep. What a wonderful, wonderful blessing we have. In a moment, we'll be singing other songs that, that express that. It's going to be next to 103 will be the next song. In that next pa passage, we are invited. Not only is the grace of God to us free, not only do we get to be his children and the brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ who died for us, but then we are invited to come in. We're, it's not something we can't attain. It is not some place or relationship to which we're not welcome, but to which we all have our own special personal invitation. One time in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, 
and I will give you rest. You don't pay for it. You don't earn it. I'll give you rest, peace, and you'll be all right. This is what he was doing for us. And the invitation, as is expressed in the fourth verse, is enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. Yes, we bless the name of Jesus. We've done so already in song. We bless the name of God. We praise and honor because when we address all those things, when we account all that he's given to us, making us his family members and inviting us in and providing for us all that we could ever need, the psalmist in the 92nd Psalm said, it is good to sing praise to the Most High. Oh, yes. Thank you, God, that you've been so giving and generous that you watched out for our souls before we ever were. And we get to say thank you. Thank you. We come into your presence with gratitude with thankfulness, and we do bless his name. The psalmist in 68 and verse 19 spoke of the fact that blessed be the name of the Lord God who daily loads us with benefits, the King James Version says. He just loads us up all the time, and we praise him for it as we sing 103. He makes me glad. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad, he has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad, he has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad, he has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. Our next song is number 123, one, two, three. You can find that one, I suppose. What a great blessing it is. No wonder, you know, we, we talked about verse one. When David said, shout, shout thanks and praise to God. No wonder he said, make a joyful noise to the Lord. Respond, say something like, 107 verse 2 said, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. We have to testify by our lives and by our words and by the demonstration of our gratitude. The attitude of gratitude is one of the most popular thought lessons that we ever have, probably. To call us back to the humble attitude that we ought to have rather than ever being full of pride and feeling able to take care of all things ourselves. You see, you ask, as the psalmist asked in a much earlier passage, who is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that you have visited him? Where is the explanation? What did I ever do, Chris Christopherson asked. What have I ever done to deserve even one 
of the blessings you've shown. Where's the explanation? It is in the next point that David makes in verse 5. He says what we kind of assume, but may not as often as we should iterate, for the Lord God is good. If you had one word to use to describe the Lord God Almighty, you might choose power, powerful. You might choose, as John did, love. But you could say, too, that that's all encompassed in God is good. Two of the major points that the psalmist is making in this psalm is that the Lord is God. He's the one in charge. And the one in charge, he is good. That's why. That's how. It's the explanation of how things are as well with us as they are. And the spiritual blessings that we have enjoyed in Christ Jesus. Paul said all spiritual blessings in heavenly places are in Christ Jesus. They come from this God who is good. He shows his mercy to us at all times. I'll not take the time today, but invite you as I usually do when we refer to Psalms 136 to read it all again. Because in every verse, the end of the verse is that the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. Why it's repeated in all the verses, I'm not absolutely sure. But I think it's for emphasis. I think it's for, get this. Note this like he said. Note that God is good. Note that God is is consistent, he's everlasting, he's eternal, and everything he promises is secure and is backed by the fact that he never makes a mistake and he never goes back on any promise. And when God said it, you can rely entirely upon it. There is no guile in him or in his intent. God is good and his steadfast love never ceases. It is about that that we want to sing in in the song one, two, three. Jed. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I will open him. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I will hope in him. Therefore I will hope in him. As we looked at verse 5, we didn't conclude, and we now will, but the song we'll sing after we have read the rest of that verse and applied it will be number 57. Number 57. That'll be the last of the songs that we sing together in the thought process of this Thanksgiving message. And at the end of it, Jed will announce the invitation song, and I'll come back and speak a bit about the invitation and we'll sing that one, but you'll need to listen to Jed for that last one. Let me go back to verse 5 of Psalms 100, and the part we've looked at is, For the Lord is good, His steadfast love endures forever, and His 
faithfulness to all generations. It's not just in our time, and not just in our culture, not just in our family, not just in this nation, but this is the God who's good to all men. And throughout the ages, before Jesus came, he was planning and preparing the way of salvation. And that invitation to all people to become the children of God, the process was constantly developing and it was evolving and, and opening and unfolding before the history to bring the time when, as Paul said, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. God had a view to give all people the opportunity for salvation. We say sometimes that when Jesus died on the cross, his blood flowed backward to cover the sins of all the righteous people who lived before him, and it flowed forward to cover the sins of the righteous people who would live after him. But anyone who ever is saved as goes into the portals of heaven for eternity with God will have been saved by the blood of Jesus. God is good, and God provides, not just for us, but for all generations, elsewhere, not just here, in other times, not just now. But for our time, God is not absent. God has not checked out. God has not given up on us, and by no means... Should we ever give up on God? Nor should we ever, ever cease to be thankful and give him praise and honor for all things because his faithfulness to us is so great. It calls for reciprocal faithfulness on our part that we cycle his faithfulness through ourselves back to him and we sing, number 57, great is thy faithfulness. Thank you, God.
see God's faithfulness, there could be no greater one than the entirely inclusive concept of the invitation for salvation. It's not exclusive. There are no lines that are drawn along nationalities, nor languages, nor races. There are no lines that are drawn along economic lines or educational lines, but it is an invitation that's universal. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, in that you include us all, you invite us all, you love us all. My, what a God we thank for salvation. And he offers it free. What a God. And not only does he make it available to everyone. He makes it available to people who've done all kinds of things. He doesn't say that if you've done this sin or that sin, you, you, you are not invited, but he encourages that if we will believe in Jesus Christ as his son. We'll just gain the, the, the thorough confidence that that's real. That, that what the Bible tells us is true and that God loves us and cares for us and, and he offers us salvation through Jesus. If we just believe that enough, that it will bring us to the next step and cause us to repent of our sin, whatever our sin might be. I've run on to people and possibly you have too, you might be one of those who have said, well, with what I've done, no one could forgive. God could never forgive me. No, no, not this God. He, he can. You, you're talking about maybe human terms and limits. This God is God. He is good, and he'll forgive when you believe enough to repent and turn. He urges us through Jesus to be willing to speak up for Jesus, to confess his name before men. And we give people an opportunity to do that before they're baptized for the remission of sins. Coming in contact spiritually with that blood as they are baptized in water as the New Testament teaches. And then being cleansed from all sin. Scripture speaks of it as being risen to walk in newness of life. New creature, born again, starting over, fresh start, forgiveness and salvation. God is good. He wants that for everyone. We sometimes realize that while letting Jesus die was a, just a, a unbelievable almost gift that Seemingly, God would have done that if there was just one of us who would say yes. He loves us all that much. Aren't you thankful? 
thankful to be among those who learn the name of Jesus, the truth of Jesus, the grace of God has been magnified in your mind, knowing he cares, he cares, and he'll forgive. Thank God that you're among the ones who had that opportunity because not everybody in the world does enjoy that, though they'd be invited if they knew. God's good, and he teaches us that if that repentance and that faith together will lead us to be willing to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, the remission of sins, that we can know what salvation is, and we can thank God. But the grace of God goes even beyond that when sometimes on the other side of that, though we had every intent to live Christian lives, we, we stumble, we get into error, and, and we're, we're really slow to come back to God sometimes because we're ashamed to come into his presence. Because of our sin, we feel like I, I can't come into his presence with thanksgiving. But his grace allows that. We can make mistakes, we can stumble, we can fall, we can turn away. And he says, come home, come home. And he gave us the parable of the prodigal son where the boy who'd made such a miserable mess decided I'm going home to my father. And he lets us do that too. If we repent as born again Christians and come back, what a God we have. He's good. I want to appeal to you this morning to consider the goodness of God, the grace of God, the love that he has, and realize that he invites you. If you need to come when we're in a moment standing and singing this song of encouragement, he watches and he waits. And my friend Charles Hodge, who recently died, wrote a book that asked the question, will God run? It's based on the parable of the prodigal son or the father. And the answer is yes. When he sees his son coming, he ran to him. God will run to you too. You need to come to him. Thank God that you can. And thank God every day for his wonderful blessings. And we encourage you to come now while we stand together and sing.